Welcome to School of PE Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Miller, and I'm so glad that you could join me this week. We are going to discuss topics about FE, PE, and SE, and we're also going to answer questions that will help students prepare for their exams. Let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another exciting episode of the School of PE's weekly podcast. I'm Chris Miller, and today I got a Mr. Louis Duque with us. Um, so please, let's welcome him aboard. And Louis, um, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited. All right, well, hey, before we get rolling into today's topic, which I find, uh, which I think is going to be an interesting topic, can you kind of, you know, let the audience have a little bit of a background on you? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I'm a bridge engineer. I work in Colorado. I've been practicing engineering for four or five years now. Um, I got my PE license last year, so that was a great milestone in in any engineer's career. Uh, beyond work, we I do a lot of podcasts as well, uh, helping other engineers and, and students and young professionals in general in their careers, finding their career purpose, finding uh, the best way to work, negotiating salary, all those things that are really hard to find information on online. Um, I started the podcast two, three years ago. Um, it's called Engineering Our Future, and that expanded into all of these other services and products that are really there to help other students and engineers um, get going in their careers and just overall fulfillment for, for what they want to do. That's a pretty cool background. I appreciate you sharing that. It looks like you provide some pretty neat and uh, needed uh, services for engineers. So that's fantastic. You know, oftentimes, you know, when someone becomes maybe a newly licensed PE or maybe they just passed their FE, they don't really know where to turn to kind of get some of the answers to some of those questions. So it's great to know that there's a resource out there like yourself. So thank you for that. So today's topic is seven habits of highly effective engineers. I think that's a pretty catchy title. So I'm excited to dive in. Um, you know, whenever someone's getting ready to take an exam, whether it's your FE or maybe you're looking to go to grad school and you're going to take your GRE or maybe it's your PE. But let's focus on the FE. So uh, tell us how you felt before you took the FE. So I took the FE back in 2016 and I'm an international student. So obviously English is not my first language. I struggled the first few years of college to just get my, my feet under me and, and really understand what I was doing. So when I first started to prepare for the FE exam, I was actually just really busy with my senior design project. I was just really busy with everything in in my career uh, as a student. So I actually ended up studying the weekend before, and that is not something I recommend to <laughs> anyone. It was a long weekend, a lot of studying, two days basically from waking up to going to bed, and was a lot. And and obviously there are better ways to study for that and we can cover those later, but that's kind of the only time I really had to study. Fortunately, I passed it on, on the first try and, and everything was good, uh, but I was confused. I was stressed. I was just not knowing what was going on. And I think I just put a lot more time into just figuring out what the exam was actually going to be like rather than like knowing the entire content. Um, Cause I was still in college. Everything was really fresh in my mind and I didn't feel like I was a bad student, so I was learning even if, if I wasn't like specific to starting the material. So again, stress, anxiety, confusion, everything uh, that is pretty normal before you enter one of these exams. All right. Well, thanks for sharing that. So you bring up something interesting. So, you know, we have people not just at School of PE, but anywhere that, you know, you might have graduated college last month or maybe you've graduated college 15 years ago and now you're pursuing your fe so you know obviously the the way you prepare is going to be a little bit different but you know right now there's a lot of kids getting ready to graduate from college and maybe they're going to think about taking their fe and some might think hey you know maybe i can put it off for a couple of years so let me ask you this Luis: if i'm graduating college this summer and i come to you and say hey you know i'm thinking about my taking my fe but i might hold off what kind of advice would you give this graduating college senior I think the best way to do it is while you're in college. I took it during my first semester of, of senior year. So there was a few topics that I hadn't really had, like steel design and some of the more advanced topics. But I think you're a student, you are already in that system, in that mentality. Just I, I think the best way is just get it done with. And, and that way, if you do it early on, you have more than one try before you graduate. Mm. And it may be a little easier on yourself. No, that makes sense. And also, you know, it's funny as you know how they say you never forget how to ride a bicycle, right? But, you know, when it comes to like statics and dynamics and even mathematics, 
it's not like riding a bicycle. You don't utilize those, it's gone, right? So let's say I'm 25 years removed from college and now I'm looking at the exam spec sheet and I'm like, holy cow, I see uh, statics, I see dynamics, mechanics and materials. And I'm like, whoa. So now you're having to spend a lot of time just kind of shaking the cobwebs loose, right? Mm -hmm. Until you can actually get to the preparation. So I agree with you. I think taking it in college, you're used to the studying for exams. You're doing it for four years in your college career, but also those topics are, um, familiar to you. So, you know, great advice. Um, so I'm assuming you 2016. So the computer, it was a computer based test, right? It was yeah. closed book. Can you kind of talk about your experience of like, you know, a lot of times people think, oh man, it's a closed book exam. You know, how am I going to know this? What's the reference book going to hold? Do I really need to become familiar with the reference handbook? So can you kind of talk about the, you know, the CBT, I guess, experience? Yeah, so I don't remember too much about it. I, I remember I most of my study was just done from the handbook, just knowing where the formulas were, what material that was available I was gonna have available during the exam, and just really getting familiar with it. Like, is it is it gonna be the fact that I only have to know certain simple formulas, or I'm gonna have to know some more, more complex formulas for for this exam? So getting familiar with the handbook, I think, is the first step, and I think it's a really important one. I really like the 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 fact that I could search within the handbook. I think that's a, a really great feature. I don't know how well kind of this will translate to the PE exam being computer based, but I think I think the FE wasn't as as code based, and there mm -hmm. were a lot of a, a lot of information related to the codes, which I think for the PE exam is going to be a little more complicated. But I think for the FE exam, just like the fundamentals, just the basics of what you're learning in school having the handbook, being able to search, I think was huge. You still get some sort of paper or whiteboard or something mm -hmm. to write down on the side, which which helps a lot as you start thinking and processing your your answers. But I, th I think there's a little bit of downside not having an open book exam mm -hmm. in terms of bringing everything you, you want. But at the same time, you get that benefit of searching within the handbook. And if you're familiar with it and know where you can mm -hmm. search and what you can search, I think that's that's a big benefit. You know, I agree. I agree. I, you know, I tell students all the time, like, you know, become best friends with this reference handbook because what's going to happen, the search function is great, you know, but if you become familiar with the handbook, you're not spending a lot of time during the exam flipping through the handbook. Mm -hmm. So you're not wasting that valuable time. You know, in terms of the PE exam, you know, it went CBT here in January. It is a little bit different because it is more in depth than the FE. But yeah, so, you know, whatever depth you happen to be, whether it be transportation, structural, you know, they do give you electronic versions of the code and standard books the only drawback is you only can have one open at a time so that mm -hmm. makes it kind of interesting um so let me ask you this and this is a difficult question i get it all the time i don't know the answer to it so i'm going to throw it to you so how difficult is the fe exam it depends on how much attention and how much effort you have put in the last three years to really understand the material in college if you are just sitting in through class taking notes and just going back home and not doing anything it's going to be really hard you're going to have to learn a lot of stuff during the month two three months that you're studying for the exam so if you don't pay too much attention during class and you are not really understanding how this material fits in the process of designing something it's going to be really hard if you're someone that goes to class with the mentality of I'm not going to memorize everything. I'm going to really understand what's happening here. How can I use these formulas to calculate stresses and forces and everything? The exam is going to be a lot simpler. And I think I kind of fall into that second bucket. And I think that's why only starting the weekend before didn't really affect the result of the, of the exam at the end of the day. But I think if you're not putting the effort within those two, three years, mm -hmm. if you take it at the end, four years, you're going to have a harder time preparing for the exam and really taking the exam. Well, that makes a lot of sense. So thank you for sharing that. So I know your preparation is a little bit different. You know, you took a weekend and you went and you hammered it out and you nailed it. So, you know, some people might take, you know, three months, some people might take four months. So if I were to come to you again, say, hey, Luis, I'm thinking of taking the exam, you know, what kind of tips can you give me to help me prepare? You know, should I read a bunch of books? Should I take a lot of practice exams? You know, what kind of advice can you give someone preparing to take the FE? I think closer to what I did to prepare for the P exam, which was taking four months before the exam. And that doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to study 20, 30 hours a week mm -hmm. for four months. It meant that I had more time to space the content, to reflect on the content, to apply all these study techniques that are 
backed by research, by science, to help you learn better and learn faster, and and just doing it in a way that it helps your studying technique and your your learning style, as well as just giving yourself a lot more time to go through the material, keeping track of what you're studying, mm -hmm. what are some of those spots that you don't have enough information that maybe you don't learn, you didn't learn well in school and and just keeping track of that stuff so you're not repeating a lot of the same content you're focusing on the areas that you feel weaker and the areas that you think you need more more studying and more effort no that makes sense so you know when someone t takes the fe and they pass the fe you know they have to get their work experience in there before they sit for the pe there are some that can do it back to back because they've already accumulated mm -hmm. enough years of work experience but you know let's say i just took mine my senior year i passed my fe now you know i'm going into the workforce get my four or five years under my belt and then i can sit for the pe how do i keep some of this stuff fresh you know from my fe to my pe yeah, that, that's hard. And I didn't take it right away. I took it in the four year timeline, which is, I think, pretty common for most states. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think we just need to be in that mentality of just being lifelong learners. If, mm -hmm. if you are a learner that continues to study the codes, you're going to become more familiar as you work in the in the depth section, you're probably going to take when you, you when you take the P exam, you are already going to know what the design looks like. You may not do every single design during your work, but you are Again, trying to be that mentality of I'm not just going to memorize a formula or a procedure for the sake of it. I'm, I'm understanding how this works and how can this be applied if the question is different, if the forces are different. And, and just having that mentality, I think, is going to be key to really keep that momentum of passing the FE, working for a few years, mm -hmm. and taking the P exam later later on. I, I've known people that take it immediately in some mm -hmm. states, like Illinois, I think Wyoming is what, another one. Um, other states like California, you can take a lot early. Again, let's. It, it depends on on your personality, your comfort level. Um, I didn't feel like I was fully prepared immediately after college, so I'm glad I waited to get more experience and and understanding on that. But again, you have to put the effort and and have that mentality of okay, I'm gonna keep learning. It's not like I'm working and and now I'm done. I'm gonna keep learning and having that material present frequently. No, no, again, that's that's great. Thank you for that. Um, you know, when you're getting ready to take an exam, again, it could be any exam, right? It could be your driver's license test, whatever it might be. There's pitfalls and there's mistakes that you can make that you want to try to avoid. You know, like sometimes maybe, you know, you might not read the entire question because you think you already know the answer. So you jump down, you mark and you're like, oh, man, I missed it. But if I would have read the question, I would have answered differently. So what kind of um, advice can you give to someone to kind of help them avoid some mistakes for the FE exam? I think a big one is just making sure they have enough rest the week before. Make sure they rest and make sure they are not overstudying and make sure they are t getting enough sleep. I think that's going to help them feel fresh during the exam. Another one is just having the experience of taking this exam. Um, it's a long exam. There's a lot of questions in there. You have to be thinking for a long time. So taking a few practice exams before, it's it's a it's a great way to know how you're gonna be feeling hour one two three of the exam, mm -hmm. and and recognizing those patterns before you even get to the actual exam. As an athlete, as someone that played tennis for ten years or more, I prepare and I practice the same way I was gonna prepare and mm -hmm. the same way I was gonna play during the actual tournament. So having that preparation, I think, is key. Knowing how you're gonna feel during the exam. Again, hour two, three, when you're starting to get tired, you start to maybe not feel as confident. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important. Just taking your time, go to the bathroom if you need to. You you, you will be fine. Like it's not. I, I took my time when I was taking the exam, and I went to the bathroom, have some water, whatever, and, and just um, take the time during that. Uh, in terms of just answering the questions, I think the best way is to again be very careful when you're reading them. Go through as many as as you can that are easy wins that you know what you're doing that are simple enough to answer and then go back and go go over the more like the more complicated ones the harder ones and and kind of repeat as needed i think that's kind of the way i approach both exams and i think just gave me a little more confidence knowing that i was answering some questions right away that i was pretty confident no i like that that's a great approach and some great advice to share so thank you for that um becoming an engineer is a long journey right mm -hmm. You got to get your degree, you got your FE, you got your PE, you got your work experience. So motivation can be a 
a big, I guess, determining factor of whether or not you make it through your journey or not. And, you know, this is, I mean, motivation's everywhere, right? So even in college, right? You know, you're sitting in your freshman statistics class and, you know, you think you're doing well and all of a sudden you see, oh man, I just failed the first midterm. You know, mm -hmm. okay, well, you have one of two choices, right? You can either study harder, work harder, do better on the next um, exam, or you can just throw in the towel and, and wait till next semester. So, you know, if someone came to you, Luis, and said, you know, I'm just, you know, I took the FE, I didn't pass it, and maybe I didn't pass it my second time, I'm, I'm thinking about taking it my third time, but, you know, what's the point, you know, like, what kind of motivation can you give to help them kind of pick themselves off the ground and continue with their journey? I think the first thing to realize is, like, you're not really, you're not alone in failing the exam. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that fail at this, a lot of people that don't pass the first time they still go on to be great engineers. So that's kind of the first thing to really understand and realize after you fail the P exam, the FE exam, any exam for that matter, is knowing that you're not alone. Um, I will say, take take some time to, to, to reassess what happened, take a week off, a month off, whatever you need to take off and, and look for some different, different answers in terms of how you're studying, how are you preparing for the exam? If this is your second, third time that you fail, are you, just keep doing the same things or are you going to change some of the things mm -hmm. to make sure you're learning better, you're learning faster, you are, are taking the time to really understand the material. And this is something that I that I teach people that, I, that I've been coaching and some courses and everything is just the fact that if you're doing the same things and still not getting the results you want to get, there is something that needs to be changed. If you keep doing the same things, you can expect to get the same results in terms of passing or not passing the exam. But there are ways to learn a lot better the science techniques, the time management techniques that uh, people can apply. And uh, some, some of the things that I, I teach in, in the courses that I have in terms of preparing for the PE exam more specifically. But in, in, at the end of the day, just realizing that you're not alone in this process. Uh, take your time to just regroup, do whatever you need to do to shake it off and start again. This is a long mm -hmm. process. There's a lot of there's a lot of ways to prepare for those exams. and um, I, I think there's a lot of resources out there that are going to help students uh, get back on track and, and understand that it, it just sometimes it doesn't go their way the first time, but that doesn't mean that has to be the, the end result. No, I 100% agree with you. And also the point that you made that, you know, if you don't pass an exam, the exam the first time doesn't mean you're a bad engineer, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about it, when you apply for a job, let's say you just passed your PE and you're interviewing for a job. I'm not, I'm guessing they're not going to ask you, Hey, did you take the PE four times? <laughs> you know, <laughs> Oh, you did. Okay. Well, I'm not hiring you. You know, there are sometimes people are just not good at test taking, right? Mm -hmm. So it might take them a couple of times. So you're absolutely right. You know, failing the exam is no reflection on your ability as an engineer. So I think that's important information that you shared with everybody. So I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we had a great time talking about, you know, preparing for the FE, your experience. So let's kind of get, let the audience get to little, know you a little bit more. So mm -hmm. let me talk to you about what are some of the projects that you're most proud of? Yeah, so I started this job that I have right now in 2020. So I haven't worked on a, a lot of different projects, but one that has been really interesting, just the nature of the structures, the Golden Gate Bridge. And we're doing a lot of interesting work out there in terms of um, repairing some of the travelers, doing some, some analysis of the whole bridge that has been really, really interesting. Um, a lot of temporary structures and everything around the bridge. Uh, so that's kind of probably the, the most interesting one that I've worked on. Oh, that sounds cool. Got, everyone's got to love the Golden Gate Bridge. Yeah. You know, I always wondered, maybe I don't know if you know the answer to this, is how long does it take them to paint the dang thing? Like Long time. <laughs> I would imagine by the time you start and finish, it's time to do it again. Um, but no, that sounds like a pretty cool project. Well, now that we kind of found out what your most interesting project is, what about what brought, what project has been the most challenging for you? I, I think I'm just going to keep with the same theme. It's, it's been a, a really complicated structure to spend the bridge that is very, very old. There's a lot of things that are not very certain. So analyzing the whole structure or one of these spans have been probably one of the biggest challenges that, that I've done, just kind of modeling the whole thing and making sure you're accounting for, for all the variables and, and the forces are applied correctly and the analysis is actually valid is is hard and it requires a lot of time, a lot of effort from many people to produce such a model. And I'm imagining the margin for error is pretty slim. Yes, yeah, so uh, we've got a lot of load to that bridge, so just making sure that he's actually going to be able to take it. 
Oh, no, I 100% agree with that. So, you know, as we're coming out of the COVID pandemic, things are starting to kind of come back to some form of normalcy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, as you were enduring the COVID pandemic with the rest of the world, what effect did COVID-19 have on you as your career as an engineer? Yeah, I mean, we were all working from home. I had started my job a month before the pandemic started. So I got to meet everyone through Zoom, through Google Meet, through all the video chat features. And it was challenging at the beginning, just kind of a new job, new people, just trying to understand how to do the work that I was hired to do. And and getting to know people wasn't easy, wasn't wasn't as, as easy as walking into someone's office or just getting in contact with them. So creating those relationships was definitely tough at the beginning. But I think it also gave us a little more flexibility with family, with other things around um, interests and everything that I don't think a lot of companies are, are as flexible as the one that I work for. And, and that's been a, a really big plus. And it's something that came out of the pandemic in terms of just having a little more flexibility in that. Um, in terms of work, I think we we had a lot of work um, just because a lot of projects were still going on. And and I, I think there was a little bit of, of complication at the beginning, just communicating how to do the work as a new engineer, at the company, it was it was just kind of that training process was mm -hmm. was done online, which is a little more complicated. Um, but I think at the end of the day, once we start going back to the office, once we once I start to just understand the nature of of the work and how to do the work more independently, I think it was a, a little easier and, and a little more automatic. That right, makes sense. You know, I could be wrong, um, but you know, you being a bridge engineer, how difficult is it to do any of your work remote? It's it's surprisingly not that different than doing it at the office. We have a lot of software that it's very collaborative and, and a lot of things that we already did before. Uh, we actually had one remote engineer in North Carolina at the time. So a lot of the technology we have is already kind of in place to work remotely. And I think that made that transition a lot easier. Oh, very nice. So here's an off, this is a random question. It's not on the sheet today, but I'm kind of curious now that I have a bridge engineer, I, I got to ask. <laughs> so what do you, I mean, how do you guys test the, I guess, just make sure that the current bridges are able to withstand the load that they made endure throughout, you know, the daily, I guess, activities? So we we actually do like bridge removal, bridge demolition. It's a little different than like new construction. Um just from what I know, there are a variety of sensors that you can put on the bridge to monitor like deflections and strains on the girders and the deck on different structure mm -hmm. components. And from there, you can basically see the amount of load you put in a known load, a truck or something, how much the, the girders, the deck, everything is deflecting, how much strain there is in those strain gauges. And from there, you can back calculate how much capacity you're going to have on that bridge. And obviously, you are able to account for damage, for cracks, for reduced capacity. And and we and that's done in a lot of bridges, especially when you see like a posted um, weight limit on a bridge that's just being probably analyzed uh, to make sure that uh, the loads are made and they're not always stressing those bridges. Oh, interesting. Thank you for sharing that. So as a bridge gets older, does the amount, I guess, does the weight of the load that it can bear also become less? If it's not maintained properly, that can be the case. Like if you have a lot of rust on a steel bridge or a lot of cracking on a concrete bridge, that can be the case. But usually um, you have enough of factor of safety that um, that's that's it's, does, it's not going to affect um, the load. Like, for example, the Golden Gate Bridge, we're talking about that early. Um, has had obviously some modifications, some improvements, but and, and obviously the design loads that we apply for bridges nowadays are higher than they were before. Um, you don't see any any significant like reduction in capacity. If you're keeping with maintenance, if you are maintaining and replacing elements as they become just badly deteriorated as you are repairing and making sure that everything is working properly. Ah, interesting. Well, thank you for that. So when you're not being an engineer, what do you enjoy doing? I, I, you know, you mentioned tennis. So what other hobbies mm -hmm. do you enjoy when you're not being an engineer? So I, I have a family with three kids. So obviously spending time with them, it's, wow. it's a big part of, of my downtime. I, I do really enjoy doing a lot of the things with Engineering Our Future, just the podcasts, networking with people, creating these resources and everything. 
Um, so that's, that takes a lot of, of my time as well. So I think between family and just kind of my side business, if you want to call it that, uh, of just teaching other engineers what I'm learning, what I've been um, just pondering and, and just educating myself with and having those resources out there is probably one of the biggest um, things that I do on the side. Yeah, very cool. That's that's great. So for everyone out there, you know, whether you just passed your FE exam or you just passed your PE exam and, you know, you're thinking about, well, not thinking about, you're probably interviewing for jobs or maybe you're, you know, you got your PE, so you're up for a promotion or whatever, and you're, you're not, you're not quite confident or knowledgeable in how to negotiate a salary. That is a you know service that Luis does, which I think is fantastic. I think that, you know, just telling people about your journey is a great way for people to kind of plan for how they can tackle getting through the FE and the PE exam. So Luis, I've truly enjoyed having you on the podcast today. You know, love to have you back. Before I let you go though, I got to ask you, you know, if I am a graduating senior in high school, and um, I'm thinking of going to be an engineer. I want to be an engineer. I'm getting ready to go to college. What kind of advice can you give to a graduating high school senior? So I think you're still pretty young when you're graduating from high school. There's a lot of opportunities out there. If you decide to go into engineering, it's a fantastic field. There's a lot of a lot of job, a lot of work that needs to be done in our profession. There's a lot of um, there's a big gap in terms of work that needs to be done and people working on it. So there's definitely a lot of opportunities in the engineering field. Don't do it because of the status that brings of being an engineer. You really need to love the science, the math, the the process of just being an engineer because it's tough. There's a lot of there's a lot of challenges that come with it. But you you still have a lot of time. Explore um, different fields of engineering. If you can't have internships in civil engineering, mechanical engineering, the different fields of engineering, talk to people, network with peers that are maybe graduating the same time as you are and, and ask them what they want to do after they graduate. Uh, reach out to people on LinkedIn and social media. A lot of people really enjoy talking about their profession, their careers, what they're doing. I certainly have talked with many high school students that are just wondering what my day-to-day -day looks like. And I'm mm -hmm. happy to share that information uh, just to help them kind of make that decision. So again, just exploring the options, I think is very important. And don't be afraid to reach out to people. A lot of people are really willing to answer questions, to jump on a 15, 30 minute call and mm -hmm. just see what they're doing. Um, again, follow people on LinkedIn that you, do you enjoy seeing different perspectives and everything. Um, I tried to share a little more information on kind of what different careers do on, on the podcast, on the blog and everything. Uh, so that's also a great way. Just read what other people are doing, learning what what engineers really do on a day to day basis, because it changes so much from from every company. Like as a structural engineer, I've ha had three jobs and it's completely different what I did when I started uh, um, my career first year that what I do now, it's it's completely different in, in terms of the work, even though I'm still a structural engineer, there's so much within that, that small branch of engineering. So get educated, ask questions, network, and just reach out to people. Well, that's some great advice. You know, there's a lot of great things about engineering. And mm -hmm. one of my favorites is probably the vast, I guess, Vast, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but I, I guess there's so much you can do in engineer, right? You can be a transportation engineer, chemical engineer. Um, so yeah, I mean, every day is different. You know, when I do these podcasts with, and I'm talking to these different engineers, that's one of the things I always mention is that every day is something different. You know, even just as you were saying, you're a structural engineer, but what you were doing in year one is different than you're doing today. So that's pretty cool. So before we let you go today or for the day, any words of wisdom you want to share with the audience? Again, I, I think the, the number one advice that I give to younger engineers, to students that are starting their careers, is ask a lot of questions. Make sure you are reaching out to people. Uh, if you are an entry-level engineer, ask a lot of questions to your supervisors, to co-workers. People are not, uh, not afraid to answer questions. They, they want you to ask questions. And I think that's something that a lot of people fail to do early on. And that could avoid a lot of conflicts when you are still learning how to navigate the workplace, still ne learning how to design something new, asking questions, having that communication, I think is, it's key. And that's by far one of the, the most important advice that I can kind of give people. Those are some fantastic words of wisdom. So to everyone out there, have a fantastic rest of the week. Luis, thanks for coming out. We'd love to have you back for another episode, but thanks for stopping by.
yeah, thanks for having me.